Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's Conversant is Christian Watson, who's a philosophy student in the illustrious state of Georgia. He also runs a YouTube channel, and I stumbled across his Twitter, and then I looked into his YouTube channel. I really liked the way that he was making sense out of politics. He is a self-described conservatarian, and uh, I think he's a Christian, but we don't talk about the Christianity on the recording. We talk about that afterwards, so just forget I said anything about that. But we do get into his version of libertarianism. I try to square it with criticisms that I've seen floating around about libertarianism and try to get a handle on his ideas. He's a very astute thinker. I enjoyed this very thoroughly. You might need to slow it down to absorb everything that he's saying. He's very erudite and another couple of synonyms for learned. Uh, so just be prepared for that. Very enjoyable conversation. Do check out his YouTube channel and links to his Twitter are of course down there in the description. So follow him as well, especially if you liked it. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that if you ask questions in the comments, he will reply. I'm not going to make any promises though. Without further ado, here is Christian Watson. What attracted you to natural law? I think that every idea that someone has, I think that every, no matter what it is, has to have some sort of basis in reality. And I see natural law as the fundamental principle of reality. I see natural law as if, well, let's say there's an ideology that's based on reality, natural law supersedes that and en all encompasses that and explains um, the foundations for that. So, for example, ethics. The idea of natural law, at least if you believe in natural law theory, now, of course, natural law is still a theory. It is still very highly debated. It is still something that is, you know, contested. I think that it is correct, however, but it is still a theory. So, I don't mean to speak as if I, it is not a mere theory, but absolute truth, although I, I do believe that natural law is pushes us and implicates absolute truth. Um, but what natural law theory does is that it would look at ethics through a mechanism that does not change depending on the taste or desires of people. A lot of time, a lot of times ethics is actually measured in terms of taste and desires. Utilitarianism is a system like that, right? Uh, a system that measures ethical propositions, the goodness or the badness of those um, relating to how many people are affected adversely by it and how many people's individual or collective pleasures, I would suppose utilitarian would say, are affected by it. Natural law says, no, 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 no. That's not right. What, what, what is correct is looking at human nature, evaluating the essence of human nature, then trying to deduce certain things from that. Okay, looking at our innate ability to be rational as human beings. Okay, we're, this is what Emmer de Vital, who was a natural law theorist, um, he, he was actually a student of Hugo Grotius. And who, again, Hugo Grotius is someone who was kind of one of the forerunners of the 17th century natural law tradition. Emmer de Vital, excuse me, says that before we can have anything else in society, before we can have um, diplomacy, before we can have trade agreements, before we can have civil society, before we can have commerce, before we can have anything else, we have to have what he calls rational self-love. He said this in his essay on the first principle of obligation. We have to have rational self-love. We have to understand who we are and we have to have an interest in who we are. This is the idea of self-interest that people like Locke took and extrapolated, people like Rand took and extrapolated. Now, of course, Rand is not working within, Ayn Rand is not working within the natural law tradition. In fact, she rejects natural law. She simply bases individual rights and in what she calls objective reality. But the idea of, of self-interest has been quite influential in forming many of these proto-libertarian ideologies that went on through the ages. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Ayn Rand was actually influenced by Isabel Patterson. Isabel Patterson um, is actually a, a student of, of a lot of political history and classical history. And I'm going to assume that Isabel Patterson most likely were the natural law theorists. So a lot of her, um, and for those of you who do not know, Isabel Patterson is one of the three people who is um, credited with jumpstarting American libertarianism. Ms. Bill Patterson wrote a book called The God of the Machine in 1943, and she um, basically gave 
her book has been has been likened to Marx's Das Kapital in terms of its influence to the formation of an ideology. Hmm. Now, that's a pretty hefty praise because Das Kapital essentially influenced and jumpstarted. Well, basically, is the Bible for Marxism. The God of the Machine is considered the Bible for libertarianism. Although some of the libertarians just forget about it, they don't really focus on it, they don't really um, think about it. So it's an obscure work, but it's a very good work of, of political philosophy in my my personal opinion. But anyway, so back to the natural law. It subsumes so many categories and provides a basis that is not predicated upon any, anything arbitrary, but is predicated upon things that we can both observe and um, discern through reason. That's why I like natural law, and that's hmm. and and this desire to have my propositions justified by what is actually real, what is actually in reality, what is actually a part of me, rather than what is desired or hoped for, uh, what is what, what is uh, manifested through our aspirations. Um, Vogel would call this emetizing the eschaton, bringing heaven onto earth, having an ideology that focuses on what is concrete as opposed to what is aspirational. Has always been something that is that that gives me a little bit more security in my propositions, my moral okay. propositions, my ethical yeah. propositions, and my metaphysical propositions. What does that do with possibility for you? What do you do when you're locked into this natural state? Then, uh, with without, with, well, I guess there's still aspiration, still ambition, still some sort of utopia that you want. Of course, have, if not just of in your course. own life. Of course, of course. So. It's important to understand. Uh, so, for the natural law theorist, you are not merely locked into nature, so to speak. The natural law theorist understands that people grow, people change, people are dynamic. They don't think that okay, this is your nature. This is for this is what all you, this is all you'll be. No, no, no. Think of nature as the stuff that pl- Plato, right? We all did Plato when we were kids, right? Plato not, not is Aristotle's uh, teacher, but the the no, very salty no, colored no, dough. Okay, no, yeah, no, Just to yeah not Plato. No, 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 absolutely not. I, I, I would, I would, I would, I would suggest that it's child abuse if you subject your kid to Plato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Play, not Plato a fan of the fine. Republic like, here. <laughs> uh, look, look, okay, so Plato. I have been overexposed to Plato on many different fronts. Uh, I have a lot of his dialogue sitting in my room. Um, I have nothing against the man. Well, I do have something. Actually, I do. I think that his political. So he tries to he tries to use metaphysics, he tries to use the ideas of the universe, what the universe is, how it is, what we are fundamentally, to create a ty- to propose a tyrannical political solution, and, and that's just the idea of the philosopher king. Now there is, of course, debate over does Plato actually mean a physical literal city. Because pe- people will say, no, well, in book three, Socrates argues that the city is the analogy of the soul. Therefore, um, yeah. he must mean just how you're supposed to order yourself, how you're supposed to order the body and everything. And guess what? That's a valid reading. But I do think there are political implications to what Plato was saying. And to ignore that is to, to endeavor in a falsehood, in my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. There are political implications because, again, the soul is conveniently so likened to a city. And – what Plato is saying is not out of the out of the reach of what a city could possibly uh, enact. I think there are just too many similarities to say, oh well, no, it's just it's he's just giving us a lesson about ourselves. It's yes, he's doing that, and the Republic is very obvious. In Book Nine of the Republic, actually, um, Socrates argues um, that you need to have justice in the soul. And for Socrates, um, having justice in the soul is having a soul that is moderated, that is balanced. The passions are in check. You're not overflowing with stuff. You're keeping things right. Um, particularly, it's called continence, the idea of self-mastery. And the idea of self-mastery, to any extent that the natural law theorists talk about virtue, because they mention virtue, but they don't do so like, like the ancient Greeks did. Like Aristotle gave you an entire book on virtue. Plato gave you entire dialogues on virtue. Natural law theorists are much more worried about um, the nature of obligation. That's more worried about, okay, how does human nature relate to political society and, and inter- inter- intercourse and, and society? That's what they're worried about, I think. They're not necessarily worried about, okay, is your soul just? They're not necessarily worried about that. Although um, there is talk of virtue in a very loose sense in natural law tradition. Anyway, um, yeah. But so yeah, for, I think for, that for, for that, Plato, that works back into the play dough that you're talking about because exactly still, precisely still, precisely there's, there's still guidelines by which you would want yourself and others to be formed or to be forming. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So um, 
So natural law theory is the stuff the Plato is made out of. Now, no matter how much you burn the Plato, you make it wet, you try to chop it into pieces, its internal nature, what it's made out of, is constant. It's still there. It's, it's, it's just not going to change. You can smash it. You can mush it. You can take a knife to it. You can chop it. You can do whatever you want to do with the Plato, um, Ben. But the Plato is still fundamentally made out of whatever, whatever it's made out of. Similarly, no matter how much you, um, well, I don't want to give the two of them a morbid example here, but let's say that you have a human being. No matter how much you reconstitute this human being, no, no matter how much you try to put um, bionic material into its body, you try to do whatever you try to do with it, no matter how much you try to alter the stuff it's made out of, it still is made out of that stuff. And if there comes a point where the human being is almost entirely a machine and not man or, you know, and, and, and for people who may be curious, um, the uh, understanding of man is that it encompasses both genders. But just for people who, mm -hmm. who, may, be, who, who may be a little bit skeptical, man or woman, you know, it, it becomes something uh, different than that, you know, a different, different category, right? Which is why I don't think a theoretical cyborg is actually a human. It's human-like, but it's not a human because the essence, the stuff which, which is made out of, is not flesh, it's not bone, it's not tissue, it's not blood, it's not um, canals going through your body, it's not veins. There's stuff that forms the fundamental component of who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, natural law is the stuff of the Plato, but how the Plato is shaped and formed that still largely is going to be an individual project. Hmm. It's largely going to be an individual project. So yeah, I am, so for example, natural law theorists, particularly Grotius, would say, okay, Christian, you have rights. And this right is what allows people to be just or unjust to you. And this right it uh, establishes the basis for civil society. And this is a theme throughout the natural law tradition as well. Um, because Locke, this kind of culminates in Locke, right? Because Locke says, uh, Locke says that you know, the, the goal of any civil society is to protect the individual's life, liberty, and property. That's the, that is the Lockean theory. That is the theory of Lockean natural rights. And he also mentions that self-preservation, so long as your self-preservation is maintained, you can help other people. But when your self-preservation comes into attack, you have to make sure that your life, liberty, and property are maintained. These are inviolable rights to lock. These are rights that are bequeathed from a source external from the human being. And so for the natural law theorists, they'll say, okay, Christian, you have rights. That's the stuff you're made out of. That's, it's in, built into your being, built into your DNA. Mm -hmm. But they don't tell you how to use those rights. They don't tell you, okay, you have a right to life, go out and be a, a plumber. You have, right, okay, you have a right to life, go out and be a construction worker. Okay, go out and be a, a teacher. No, no, no. No, mm. that's, that's the Play-Doh in formation. That's okay. me taking that Play-Doh and just mashing it around and forming it around and making a shape, making a pretzel, making a castle. So essentially, and, and, that, and actually the Play-Doh kind of demonstrates the elasticity, I think, of freedom, just how, how boundless I think human freedom can be in terms of the possibilities that it can chase. Not boundless in terms of what it is. It's, very, it's a very defined thing. It's a very defined thing. It's not boundless in terms of what it is, um, but it's boundless in terms of what it can be used for. That's the Plato, because Plato to is to all intents and purposes boundless in what it can be. Yes, exactly, into. exactly. But obviously, there is limitation because the natural law theory theorists are quite are quite clear. If your rights intersect someone else someone else's rights, then you're, it's over. And this is a, this is an idea that modern day libertarianism has kind of taken and it's kind of used it um, for its for its sort of ethos, mm -hmm. right? When Wait. your rights intersect. Oh. Are yeah. you, would you consider yourself a part of the modern libertarian yes. well, flow or tree, yes. um, shrub? What do you, what do you, what's your, <laughs> are you guys a goose? Uh, what's your flag? What's your oh state my. flower? Oh my, oh state flower. Oh, well, you know, states are evil, you know. Has anyone told <laughs> oh, yeah, you? Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, man. Oh, ben. Uh, no, so yes, I am a libertarian. Although, look, I like to say that I'm a conservatarian. Do you know what that means? Uh, you're going to have to define it, if not for me, then for uh, 
uh, an audience. Yeah, yeah, because I, I always like to ask because I don't want to assume that people because it's a, it's a, I think it's a common kind of ideology in current America and current contemporary America. So mm-hmm. I never want to assume that people are you know don't want don't know what it means. But so basically, a conservatarian is simply an individual who believes that as Frank Meyer, the man who articulated a conservatarian view, that the traditions of America that ensure individual liberty um, should be a constant in society are are absolutely integral to the idea of non-coercion, non-interference, and being able to live out your human liberty with the state acting as a protector, as a minimal state, as, as articulated by Robert Nozick, uh, a night watchman state, which, well, if you would uh, state that simply um, zone, hones in uh, mm-hmm. to defense, con- uh, defense to um, uh, police, and that's about it. That is the kind of um, that is the kind of ideology that would be beneficial um, to that understanding. The conservatarian argues. So basically, mm-hmm. you want to conserve something here. Conserve, you want to conserve something. But it's different from traditionalist conservatives because they want to conserve certain institutions for the sake of themselves. Oh, the family? Oh, we need that for the sake of society or for, the, for, for ourselves or for whatever. Okay, okay. oh, um, uh, you know, um, this particular norm here, this particular norm about how we dress, oh, we need that so we can maintain cohesion. But for the conservatarian, it's like, no, 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 no. Does the family help get us towards a sense of individual liberty? And in a sense, it does. I mean, because if people have their families to help them in times of crisis, they don't have to go over to the government. Because government is kind of the, uh, for the libertarian theorist, are kind of is kind of the the chief enemy of one ability to be individually free. Because of course the government is simply coercion, and coercion and freedom have a very there's a hard tension between those two things. Whereas the family, according to many libertarians, or at least according to natural law theory, Locke at least according to Locke, let me say that, because natural law theory is very broad. According to Locke, it's contractual. According to Locke. You can choose who you want in your life, who you don't want in your life, you want in your family. But for a conservative, a, a traditionalist conservative, I should, I should say, it's not, it's not, they're not interested in that. For them, the family exists and it is resolute. It is not contractual. So there are some fine differences. But I think mm-hmm. that more oftentimes than not, a conservatory and, and a, con- a, traditionalist, a, tra- ah, excuse me, a traditionalist conservative will be on the same page on some can be very core issues, Mm. but primarily just for a very, be very short, a conservatarian is someone who believes in conserving traditions in America that provide, that defend individual liberty. And they also believe that virtue is something to take place in the private sphere. And that liberty is the only means by which someone can obtain and cultivate virtue and that the government need not interfere or try to impose that upon anyone else that's a conservatarian whereas that like, sounds profound it, if we can... made... yeah sorry sorry go on sorry we, we broke up just a bit but you said that liberty is the one right that's being kind of um enforced by the state but every virtue is for the individual to cultivate on their own or not yes. cultivate on their own. Liberty is the yes. only social, just taking that idea. It seems like there's this, there's this division between the public and the private. Is that yes. correct? And, and that's right. That's right. That's right. And, and one, one, that's if right. you, if you dial up that you're, you can do whatever you want, as long as you don't infringe on other people. If you dial that up, everything that you do, no matter what it is, is infringing somehow, uh, positively or negatively on everybody that you interact with, uh, what you're consuming, uh, connects to an entire economic system so that all the consequences of everything you're consuming is, is tight. You can't completely abstract yourself from society. And I think that there's certain forms of libertarian thinking that kind of faultily kind of just make this uh, abstract kind of individual versus society or like there's this porous boundary or this Im- Im- immutable boundary between the private and the public. So I'm just wondering, how do you cultivate like a nuanced understanding in the interactions, right. all those contracts that you're making between yourself and the world? Right. And this is actually something I think Vocal Distance recently put on his Twitter. I think I saw him recently criticize libertarianism for this. And and look, I, I, I think that it, 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 it
it's built upon a premise that doesn't recognize the purpose as to why society was instituted in the first place. At least if you believe John Locke, Locke would tell you society exists, civil society in his in his opinion, the society that you know the government is over exists solely to protect your ability to self determination. That's what it exists for. Now, a society like that cannot be understood in the grand terms that you used. It can't be understood as, as, mm. as, as a culmination of economic interests and passions. It can't be understood as, in other terms, as a, as a sort of continuum of, of sports interests and, and concerts and, and music tastes. Society can't be understood like that because ultimately, if society is simply the result of, of a bunch of people peacefully um, uh, pursuing their self-determination, then you have to ask, okay, what are they pursuing the self-determination for? And there is no possible logical way without committing the generalization fallacy. You can get to that answer without Get with, without uh, by uh, excuse me by making a a broad statement about what society is by having this sort of massive society as an organism or a beehive right one of my favorite writers Rosewood Lane who was also mm-hmm. considered one of the three founders of libertarianism she says that a lot of people view society as a massive organism like a beehive in which everyone does what they are what their role is and everyone acts in a sort of determined kind of way and everything affects everyone it's just broad thing that really we don't have control over we're just in it, we just exist in it. That's a wrong way to think about it. Because Lang would also tell you, okay, but what about what I do in my individual life? What about when Bob meets Sally? What about when uh, I go to the store and I go buy some cashews? I love, I love cashews, by the way. They're delicious. I go buy some cashews from the cashier. I give them my money or my credit card. What about that? What about when I go see a pastor? I haven't been to church for a very long time, but still, theoretically. What if I talk to Benjamin Boyce? I mean, that's society. That is society in a very real sense, but it doesn't seem like it because it's us doing things, and it's not this grand idea. Yeah. But the principle of differentiations kind of, uh, kind of uh, cements this idea of society that I'm propo- proposing to you, because the principle of differentiations would say, well, and this is a, I'm not sure if this is an actual principle. This is just something that I've thought of. So, <laughs> excuse me if people think, begin googling it. All I would say is that, you know, there are a okay so. Let's say a country, okay? Because I think a country is probably the best way, it's probably the, the, the vehicle for society to exist in for many people. Okay, you have a country, you have America. Okay, the West Coast is very different from the Southwest. Texas is very different from California, evidently. Well, as to why people except are for all the Californians <laughs> moving to uh, uh, yeah, Oh, yeah, exactly. They're fleeing there because of the high taxes and the, and the cronyism. But still, <laughs> I mean, culturally, though, and I, hey, that, that may change. Yeah. Hey, we have an yeah. influx of people coming from – their values come with them. So that may change. We don't know. Uh, could possibly change. But still, it's very different culturally. Yeah. The south of the Rio Grande – or, or the or the Rio Grande border, the towns on that border are very different culturally from Austin, Texas which is like a few hours north, I think. I mean, uh, Georgia, where I'm at, is very different from Florida. I mean, the north part of Florida is pretty much kind of the same of South Georgia, but everything else is pretty different. You know, it, it, the idea that there are these differences means that there is not a single one quality that reverberates across all of society the exact same. You see what I'm saying? Which is why I think it's a little bit hard. If you go deep enough, society. there has to be something that's unified. Yeah, no, I, unified. I do think you have to, yes, there has to be unification. But I think you can have unification of values without having a, a organism, organistic understanding of society. So okay. we can share similar values without all, you know, operating on the similar playing on a similar playing field because example i can i can value individual liberty and non-interference in my life and someone else can too and they may be a monk and i'm, and I'm, 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 I'm i may be a, 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 a nightclub owner you know but society wouldn't simply be interested in my valuing of non-interference society would be interested in both my valuing of non-interference and a certain type of conduct that that supersedes that single value it'll be interested in doing because like for example um, when you have a lot of conservatives who, who, who complain about pornography, well, I mean, under the principle of non-interference, someone watching pornography in their room should not even be a concern in your mind unless there's someone you know. Even then, they probably shouldn't be a concern in your mind unless, like, unless you're like a parent, like your son. That's very different. The dynamics are very different. Hmm. But what they say is this is impacting society 
when in all reality, it's really only impacting very negatively a, a small subset of men uh, and women to a lesser extent, but men who happen to become addicted. And even uh, poor addiction, I'm not even sure if it really exists in all honesty. I'm not, I, I, well, I'm very skeptical. Let, let's just take I, I'm the, very skeptical. The, but, but, let's I'm, just hold, take hold, the. Hold on, hold on. Hold, yeah, hold on. Because yeah. I, 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 I know I just opened a can of worms here. But uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> so my, my point is this. My point is this. If you take porn use in Utah, which is a majority Mormon state, that's bad. Right. That has an impact because there was an expectation of it having an impact. You go to New York City, they're conservative New York City, but still, it's not as a big deal up there. You go to South, uh, you go to South Mississippi or whatever, to some town that is fundamentalist and you move a casino there, see what happens. It it wouldn't go over well. Mm -hmm. But you go over to Vegas. Hell, it wouldn't be able to compete because there's so many casinos there. (laughs) Society has to be understood not as this grand thing in which a a lot of um, values are are equally distributed, but as the sum of micro interactions that occur, those interactions occur on a similar playing field, on a playing field of mutual respect, of self-interest merged with understanding the need for others, on the comparative and absolute advantage of social life, as the economists would say. Yes, that's the mutual ground. That's the unifying ground. But that's about all we have in common inherently as people who inhabit the same nation. Now, I can have things in common with you individually, of course, but as people who inhabit the same nation, all I have in common with you on that micro level is my, um, again, my, my, my self-respect, my self-determination, my willingness to get enter into contract with you, my willingness to exchange mutual intercourse with you, my willingness to respect your stuff. That is a, a better understanding of society for me than simply saying, oh, Harry Styles is wearing a dress. This is better for society. Okay. I guess it would yeah. be bad for 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 um, Mormon dress norms in Utah. Which guess what? I, I I'm not deriding those. Hey, they have the right to believe what they want to believe. There's something there's there's something to be said about modesty. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm a conservatarian, so I, I there are some things that I say. Okay, I understand. Although I think I can criticizing Harry Styles over his dress is kind of stupid. But still, when you say it impacts society, you're making you're abstracting what society means and getting away from what it actually is, and that is okay. the sum of interactions amongst individuals. Sorry, for okay. that long speech. <laughs> no, no. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get my head around your head, and your head's pretty uh, dynamic head. So forgive me if we, oh we're my. gonna have to take some of these. Is that things. a good thing or a bad thing? Peaceful. I'm enjoying it, to be honest. But <laughs> what what do you think about the idea? There's a very infectious idea, and it doesn't make sense to me because I kind of think the way that you do. But this idea of social justice, and I'm not just ta- – I, I am talking about the movement of social justice, but underneath that movement and all the effects and the affects of this movement called social justice is this idea that society or that there's a social construct, it's imperfect, and the right thing to do – is to perfect that. The right thing to do is to provide justice for the downtrodden. And there has to, and there's a lot of good virtue in that, insofar as one person helping another person provides a net good, insofar as that does happen. And it doesn't always happen when you intend to do something good for somebody. It doesn't always actually result in a net good. But there's something very infectious, especially in people who are in undergraduate uh, programs right now in, in the United States of America, and a lot of the infrastructure of our higher education and our lower education, too, is geared towards right. creating this social justice outcome. Yes, it is. What, what are your thoughts of that? How You, you did a, a video on, on Joe Biden's speech the other night that I think right. it, there's a lot of ideas that you're talking about. And I just want to use right. your kind of uh, very atomized idea of society as just this network, <laughs> this incredibly chaotic network of microtransactions that are innumerable, right. uncountable. All I can do is really be responsible for myself and hope that right. there's this overarching power structure that is keeping everybody kind of in check softly and yet to provide yes. the maximum amount of liberty. How does that... Yes. 
succumb to social justice or how does it butt up against social justice and how does social justice not win in that situation because they have the moral right. authority they have the numbers they have the institutions and they want to create those institutions even stronger to affect their uh, great will they've got moral obtuseness not so much moral authority <laughs> they've got moral obtuseness what they have uh okay well, let me try to be nice um okay so i and i must i must compliment you you just summed up libertarian social theory more beautifully than i have heard anyone else sum it up and i have heard me sum it up Oh. The idea of us to these sort of chaotic um, transactions that take place in the space and the soft authority, beautiful. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Um, so how does it butt up? Okay, so social justice. Okay. It's a few things. It's an abstraction. So social justice is an abstraction. The sort of micro interactions of society are very much real things. Now, we can have abstract ideas to explain what they may mean significantly. But the problem is social justice doesn't have just ideas to explain what things mean materially, although they do. They kind of just stay in the clouds and try to bring the clouds onto Earth and make Earth the clouds. That's the problem. It's an abstraction. So when we talk about justice, what are we actually talking about? This is a very – this is again, this is a very complex idea that has been debated from Aristotle to John Rawls to, and still, still right now is still being debated. And, and for the ancient Greeks, I know that justice was about uh, – really about the self, the soul, virtue. Uh, it was about – um, for Aristotle, it was about balance and the means, obtaining the means. But for Grotius, justice was about ensuring that individual rights were protected. It was about um, making sure that the inherent value of individuals, which is understood through reason and it's enforced by the idea of the natural law, which is that we are rational, intelligent individuals who have the capability to interact with people in society, to to think through problems, to to reason, to to create concepts, that all that value that's built up into us, according to natural law theorists, all of it is wrapped behind this figure, this face, this being of uh, of of the human being and it should and that is protected by uh, an understanding of individual rights and so if you understand justice that way then social justice becomes untenable because social justice what it does is it it it, it says this your individualism uh, and, and people would call it atomism. I don't think, I don't think, I'm not sure that's the case. I think that society is very important. It's just how do we understand society? <laughs> um, but your individualism doesn't matter. What matters is the a few things, actually. A, what group do you belong to? B, how marginalized is that group? And C, um, how far is that group in recovering from the marginalization? If you are a gay African-American um, a Jew in, in, in America, I guess they would call you hyper marginalized and they would say, okay, well, if we understand intersectional identities the right way, then you need help in some way, shape or form. Um, if you are, and where does that help woman, come from? That that help comes well, from well, a so the help, policy conceptualization. It, it, policies typically, because we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the conceptualization okay. uh, of that social justice gets to, and and how they divvy out their solutions. But it simply comes from a policy or a system, because according to them, these are systemic issues. So we'll get to mm -hmm. that in a second. Um, but if you are a comparatively a white woman, well, I mean, you're a woman, right? And women have had a hard time, right? But you're still white. And whiteness is the problem. Whiteness is the, the linchpin of, uh, of of oppression. So, I mean, yeah, you may have some problems in the in the workplace or whatever, but you're still white. You still have white privilege. You still you don't have it as bad as everyone else. This becomes less about justice and more about preferences that are derived. Hear me closely. Preferences derived from narrow understandings of history and he, the human being. Preferences derived from narrow, and I would even say emaciated understandings of both history and the human being. Not understanding the human being as a sort of rational, autonomous, intelligent creature that has the ability to deduce certain things and to understand the world in more than just in a multi-layered way, but understanding the human being as simply as a consequence or in so relation to the consequences of certain social actions. This is the trouble. Going back from social justice to something else. This is the trouble of Foucault. Yeah. This is the trouble of anyone, any theorist that has tried to 
to enshrine the idea of power um, into their analysis and make it the dominant and sole consideration, this is their trouble. They, de they deny the creative element, the descriptive element in who we are as human beings. So that's the first problem with social justice. It kind of mm -hmm. rejects the complexity of the human being and simplifies everything under systems. It also doesn't recognize that systems themselves are, again, simply products of individuals. It gives a sort of metaphysical deifying quality to systems. So, for example, um, when you have, okay, so for, for a social justice person, they're worried about, okay, how have systems of power marginalized people? And how are they still marginalizing people? They will look at the police and they will look at the relationship between a police officer and the relationship between a black person. And they'll say, OK, in this context, in this cultural context, there is a, a sort of line of marginalization here, of oppression here between these two groups. But it doesn't rec rec recognize that or allow for the fact that, you know, that black person could be Jimmy from down the street whose father is, is a police officer and whose father has actually been in the police department for 30 years and has been one of their most outstanding citizens and is now uh, a part of the police department's community outreach, community policing work that is actually increasing community confidence in the police station. Hmm. Oh, we, we, can't, we can't think about that, though. You know why? It's a system. So they take systems from beyond human will, beyond human mm -hmm. volition, which systems are simply tools used to execute human volition in different sections of society. Mm -hmm. The police is a tool used to execute human volition in the sort of sector of, of, of I want to say preserving rights, but not all laws preserve rights. So I would say to maintain the rule of law. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Not all policy, laws deserve rights. Police, although, policy. Yeah. yeah, policy, precise, precise. Although all laws should preserve rights, ideally, but not all do that. Some laws egregiously violate them. So that's what that's what that system is. But how that power is executed is very different, is it not? In fact, built into the system is the idea of officer discretion. Officers have, and they still do, regardless of the policies in place, the laws in place. There are many officers, even in the most rural of towns, the most conservative of towns, that will say, we will not prosecute you or arrest you if we find marijuana in your car on a police stop. Even though it's still illegal to have marijuana in your car, their officers say, we're not going to do that. So it assumes that systems have this sort of overriding uh, ability or power over how individuals think and act and, and are affected, which is just not always true. In fact, again, at the very base of systems is the individual will. Now, do systems have effects that are large and wide? Yeah, I mm -hmm. think so. But again, I can still have a law that says marijuana is criminalized, and that law can have an effect for a very long time. But this, the fact that the system has that law as a part of one of its features does not mean it will always be followed, even if that feature still exists. Because right now we're seeing as societal attitudes have changed and have gone back to understanding and respecting the autonomy of the individual, the mm -hmm. system – it's also dialing back as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not the system that is the problem. Perhaps it's attitudes that are the problem. Do you see where I'm going with this, Ben? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is social justice? It's an attitude. <laughs> so what you see here, you see a transference. Now, it's a paradigm, but it's also an attitude. Okay. Because an activist is a kind of person with a certain kind of attitude. You cannot be an activist and be very meek and agreeable. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm an activist, and I I want to just you know I'm just here to you can be an ally and make sure everything. Oh, you could be an ally, yeah. A the allies are particularly the meek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you're you're terrible. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I mean, in the activist, the idea of the activist, is someone who will not belligerently but forcefully go after their aims. Yeah. and hit them out of the park, or try to at least. You don't have, you know, the idea of a docile, um, servile activist, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So social justice is as much of an attitude as it is a paradigm. When attitudes take hold of institutional power, mm. the system simply transfers hands, and you get a new kind of policy. Mm. You get a new kind, some would argue, of oppression. You get a new well, kind of it. Dep it depends and, on the will at the base of the system. If the system is the extension course, and precisely. the attenuation of human will, 
collective yes. will, be, albeit whoever's whatever value, whatever attitude or value set or no paradigm is at the base is yeah. what will be output. So if, if it's a non-oppressive Precisely. or an anti-oppressive attitude, then you're going to have a non-oppressive or anti-oppressive Precisely. system. Precisely. Precisely. Naming your Precisely. attitude anti-oppression doesn't make it anti-oppression. You, you actually, no. the name has nothing to do with what you actually, you have to look at the effects in order to gauge it. Precisely. It you got it. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. That's right. That's right. Exactly. But for them, oppression is an inherent part of systems because because for them systems and this is actually kind of true what i'm about to say systems of power particularly governments are built off of hierarchies and they are they are yeah. i mean you have a president you have a vice president you have a bureau of the house you got a secretaries of education yeah there are hierarchies yeah of course there are and there's nothing about the hierarchy for many of these people that is inherently oppressive because it apparently it, it it positions certain people over certain people and therefore gives someone power over certain people this goes back to the marxian idea of of the of the bourgeois proletariat the producer and the worker relationship this is just uh, it's why i think that this you know these social justice ideas are basically just Marxian, Marxian mores and adages phrased in different language, even if they don't know they're, know it is, even though they're not really advocating for a certain kind of economic theory, although I guess they are because they are advocating for equity in, in economics, right? There's a kind of social justice, uh, economic justice, right? Making sure yeah, that black re- folks reparative. get money. Yeah. Reparative, yeah. So, so I think that even if it's not explicitly based on Marx's stuff, you do see parallels between how a social justice person views the economy, views systems, views individual relations with how a Marxist would. Perhaps you see more of a prescriptive bent with a social justice person because for Marx, funnily enough, he doesn't really tell you why you should believe him. Marx describes things. He describes his idea of the world. He describes the dialects of materialism, the idea that the workers will come and the worker and class conflict will come to head and the workers will overthrow the, the producers and they'll get their value back. That he just describes things. He tells you a story, a very elaborate story, a very story with, with many different parts into it, but he tells you a story. But he does not, there is no Marxian ethics. <laughs> he does not really tell you why you should believe him. The, uh, the 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 social justice person will tell you why you should believe him absolutely. So so there's obviously a a a material difference, mm. a difference of objectives between yeah. Marx and the social justice person, but there is still many paradigm similarities. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a okay. I'm I'm going to speak poetically and let me flesh it out just briefly. Please do. There is a similarity between liberation and liberty even if only on an <laughs> etymological level. But the social justice warrior the and the critical theory uh, theorists mm-hmm. and uh, that whole paradigm, which is very inserted into higher education and is promulgating outside through media and all these other different spigots of information into mm-hmm. our world, yeah. they are seeking liberation. Liberation is a very high value. That sounds a lot like a libertarian who doesn't want to be a part of a system, doesn't want to be a part of oppressive hierarchy. No. What's the difference between a libertarian's uh, position, uh, relationship to hierarchy, to organization, and to structures of that, uh, you know, policy incentive structures uh, and huge systems like that, as opposed to the social justice uh, uh, plight for liberation? The origins thereof. The origins thereof. So it's all about genesis. For the social justice person, these systems, by virtue of having hierarchies, are just seeped in power imbalances. And those power imbalances must inherently mean something immoral is going on. For the libertarian, if there is a genesis of quote unquote power imbalances that occur in a voluntary manner in which people consented to be a part of those power imbalances, so, for example, you consent to join a corporation, you consent to join a club, a group, anything like that, then they are not inherently evil because you can withdraw your consent at any time. Now, the, the logical question is, okay, Christian, but what, what, what about the government? That's the logical question because you don't really consent to the government, do you? Well, well actually, it's actually a very complex question because according to Locke, you do. According to Locke, and this is, of course, I'm, I'm kind of uh, importing – um, 17th century language into 21st century vernacular. So please excuse me if something gets lost in the translation. But Locke has the idea of compl- implied consent. 
which is that simply by driving on a road or using anything the government does, you're consenting to the government. And that's not, that's just, that's, that's, that's illogical. <laughs> that's illogical because there, these things and systems and symbols exist uh, in a manner that many of us who are even conscious enough to question these things, we kind of have to use them. We have to kind of use roads. We have to kind of use. So, uh, so that just makes no sense. And there are David Hume kind of said, lock, that makes no sense. Here's what I think, mm-hmm. the idea of general obligation. Um, but regardless, I think the genesis of these things is what's important. Now, it's for the government. The reason why many libertarians dislike the government is because it's coercive, not because there, it has hierarchies. Um, we don't care if you have a hierarchy or not. A gun is a gun. You have a gun at my head and you're threatening me. I don't care if you're you and, and, and you know, the board directors and the, the assistant director and the assistant secretary and the secretary's, lot, well, the secretary's son and the secretary's. I mean, I don't yeah. care if all of you guys and, and are like, your board of directors the has the right uh, – <laughs> armada of, of uh, ethnicities yeah. and genders yeah yeah no we don't care we don't care how many people are pointing the gun at us the fact that the gun is there is what's important but for them the uh social justice people the in, the very idea of hierarchies is inequality and inequality is a kind of injustice and that and that injustice is enshrined through power and power is, re- is refracted through the hierarchies Different levels of power are refracted through the hierarchies. Therefore, mm. we have to be liberated from that. A libertarian just says, look, dude, have whatever kind of hierarchies you want. You want to have the chief, you the, 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 the chief butt kisser, have the chief butt kisser. You want to have the assistant butt kisser, have him. You want to have the shoe shine. You want to have the president. You want to have the, you wanna have the vice president. You want to have a whatever you want to have. Have whatever you want. Have, have whatever you want. Just don't try to force me into involuntary relationships. Whereas the, hmm. the social justice person kind of says, no, 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 no. We want to force you into this sort of involuntary union of what we think equality is. They mm-hmm. won't say that exactly, but that's kind of what the, their objective is. So yeah, the material yeah. difference is how the gen- it's gen- genesis, right? Where does it arise? Libertarian opposition to power mostly comes from um, just the consent issue and the coercion issue both of which concern natural rights for many libertarians or individual rights for some libertarians. Some libertarians don't like the natural rights idea. Mm-hmm. Whereas for the um, woke activist, it's all about the, the inherent, the features inherent into these terms, the features inherent into these ideas and uh, how those features play in the sort of systems of oppression and marginalization that they theorize the society is composed out of. So one, one side is about non-interference. The other is about the wrong kind of interference. We want interference mm-hmm. if we're woke, but that we want different kinds of interference, interference that elevates certain people on the basis of equity. Yeah. So yeah. that's and, probably the main difference. Okay. What, <clears throat> what broke you toward this direction? What was something in your life or, or, cause I think Unfortunately, a lot of people's philosophies and uh, polit- and their p- politics come down to a disposition. It's a, it's a pre-attitude. There's a disposition that inclines you towards different attitudes. And, you know, I think a part of the way that we're going to solve or mitigate some of the destructive forces within social justice is to redirect people's dispositions Certain people have disposition for caring. Certain people don't have a disposition for rationality. And no matter how much, how rational your arguments are for basing rights on rationality, you're not going to reach people who are essentially moved by and toward the irrational. They're moved, let's say, by status, by emotions, by caring, by by other pursuits like that. So I, I see that the rationalist camp is hobbled if they can't attenuate themselves to the irrational nature within mankind. We're not just rational beings, and you can't just treat people rationally, especially when the woke have decided to cut the wind out of the sails or, you know, just completely rob rationality of any sort of of sail. That's what you're dealing Um, with in this landscape. That's an interesting thought. I don't think I quite agree with the idea that we're not rational beings. I think we are rational beings. I think that we are simply dealing with the aberration of irrationality, which is a different thing. So mm-hmm. an essential component of a human being and a proximal component are two different things. So if I say that we are rational beings, I, I, I am 
I guess by necessity, I'm, I'm willing to admit that we have the capacity for both rationality and irrationality. Rational people can be irrational all the damn time, of course. I think the irration, a rational um, hmm. engine in one's mind is a sort of prerequisite for being able to be irrational, because again, the principle of dualistic concepts, but you can't really have rationality without having another concept that is rational, right? Mm -hmm. So that's right. But do I think that irrationality is ingrained into who we are as a human being like rationality is? No, I don't think so. I think it's an aberration. Um, but I do get what you're saying. Really? Okay. You think that lust is the aberration to uh, philosophy of mind because lust is well, how I don't, the human being came to be, whereas the mind is something that was shaped over the course of sexual selection. You is, see, that is, there, is lust? there are lower, there are, there are powerful forces that animate us that proceed and are right. at a lower level of consciousness than rationality and for rationality to pretend that there's no elephant in the room to kind of make a nod towards jonathan Haidt, the writer and the elephant is, right. is to really miss out on one the reality of what a human being is and two how right. to reach other people and then to ensure that that society doesn't go off a cliff so I think there's a manifest difference in saying that we are rational beings and saying that we were always rational. Those are two different statements. Mm -hmm. So one simply talks about capacity. Another talks about conduct. We are talking about conduct. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. A lot of our times, our conduct is not really rational, although I'm not entirely sure. And I've never, I'm not, I've not really read Height. I've not read Pinker. I've not read any of those folks. I, I, I'm going to get to them. So I don't want to um, attack the others without reading them. But I'm not entirely sure that Lust, is lust irrational? I mean, does it have to be irrational? I mean, uh, I think that a rational person can understand that what they're doing, I don't want to get too graphic, but what they're doing <laughs> in that moment, you know, is that it's a fantasy, you know? I think that a rational person can understand that. Now, if you have like obsession, like, oh my gosh, Britney Spears is the hottest thing ever. Not anymore, but you know, Britney Spears is the hottest thing ever. And like, I'm just obsessed with her and I, I love her. I'm writing her letters. Yeah, that's a rationality that is more about by lust. So I think lust can bring about irrationality, absolutely. But is it is necessarily irrational? I'm not. But the point you said about forces can, um, moving us towards certain positions is correct. I think that's correct, which is why I don't think that every human being is always rational. I'm not even always rational, um, but I think we have the capacity to be rational. What do you think and, about that? Well, no, we, we do. So the... The question then becomes, for me, in my work, how do you excite, inspire rationality or rational discourse or <laughs> be rational? Because uh, if it is a capacity, that, it has to be unlocked, thing. and there are certain yes. situations in which it is locked down. And uh, a lot of what we call wokeness or social justice or intersectionality, blah, 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 critical theory, a lot of that stuff is set up specifically to undermine rationality, to, yes, to it is. you know, all these Kafka traps, all these rhetorical tricks, all these illogical loops, shut down rationality, make, make the discourse completely irrational so therefore we can have a power game ultimately for for us to have right. that that power struggle exactly and I, I think that many of these critical theorists and people who operate in that same mature uh, conceptual headspace you just talked about i think most of them actually legitimately believe that they are actually deconstructing concepts that are part of oppression i think that and there are critical theorists who believe that logic is a, is, a, is a vestige of white supremacy. The, they exist. And I now, the idea, uh, I, I think it would be, I guess it would be somewhat cynical, although not unreasonable, to believe that they're doing it to undermine our ability to fight against their theories. That's somewhat cynical. You know, the idea that someone would devote their entire life as an academic, but if they're an academic CRT person, to undermining basic tenets of Western civilization just so that ideas couldn't be fought. But it's not unreasonable, given how their ideologies operate, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, but no, I think, I think to answer your question, how do we excite the rationality? You have to show people on their level how their premises are self-defeating. So for and, and this can be – and look, mm. you don't have to – people divine rationality of, as this sort of 
a lot of people think of it as a sort of mathematical process that allows us, that allows us to be devoid of emotions and to be cold, hard, Vulcans in Star Trek, or you know, a Terminator, so to speak. Okay, I'm going to rationally analyze how to kill you in seven different ways. If you're Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator, I mean, that's not this is not rationality, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It can be that, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, I think that rationality can indeed. Be proximal to emotion without being guided by emotion. So what that means is I can think in ways that consider emotional impacts and may even incorporate emotional appeals while still having my conclusions and my premises predicated upon non-emotional things. It's like a style of rhetoric almost. So I mm -hmm. would say you use rationality and proximity to emotion to reach people where they are. And that's what I do a lot of times. Uh, I never say, well, as a black man, I went through this and therefore you should believe me because that's just like, that's, that's entirely a rational position. But I do say, well, I understand that how you as ex -identity, identity here can believe this and can feel like this. However, have you considered this? So, for example, if someone says, well, you know, as a black woman, I'm at a significant disadvantage in society, I, I, look at, I look at them and say, okay, what disadvantage is manifesting in this conversation with me right now? And most of the time when I say this, they look at me and they just stare. Like, what, is, what are you talking about? I'm like, hold on. You said you had a significant disadvantage in society. What's society? Society is this right here, right? We're talking, right? This is a kind of society, right? It's not everything, but it's a kind of like, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. What disadvantage is manifesting right now, right here in this space? You tell me. Well, we have different experiences. Okay. That may be so. That may be so. But guess what? It's kind of an advantage for you, isn't it? Because I, if you have a different experience than me, I can't conceptualize you to be what I want you to be. I am actually forced to sit here and try to listen and understand you if I want to be epistemically righteous. So actually, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't really know everything about you. I don't have this sort of totalized image of you. Unless you present yourself as only a black woman in society, in that case, there are plenty of stereotypes mm. that I can use to discern things about you, but those are not actually who you really are. But the mm. problem is the woke language uses stereotypes in a different manner to assume mm. so many things about people on the, on the basis of their, on their arbitrary characteristics. That's how I explain it to people. I'm proximal to emotions. I'm giving them about, I'm, I'm giving a sense of emotional validity to them. I'm saying, okay, I understand you, but you're misunderstanding. You're missing the mark. You're misunderstanding what actually is going on. Now, I've tried this a few times. Most of the time, people get mad and they just walk away from me. But sometimes it's led to kind of, <laughs> it doesn't work all the time. But sometimes it lets the conversation be like, okay, you know what? I get what you're saying. I still believe this, but I'm happy you engage me. And if that's all you get out of someone like that, that's all you need. Because you planted a seed in their mind. Mm -hmm. You affirmed their want to use emotions to understand the world without actually doing so yourself and compromising the integrity of your positions. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. That's what you do. Now you asked me a question about, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go on. Just, I just needed to make a footnote about rationality being tied to consequences and being able to see how actions affect the future as a non-emotional yes. calculus. You can use your intuition and stuff like that, but you actually have to yes. think through how are things going to eventually happen. And so you can still root yourself in, in the moment, the emotional moment, yes. but still you know, make decisions yes, about sir. behavior by judging it against the future. But I did ask you yes, about sir. your personal life, yeah. if that's where yes. you're going to go to. Like what, what caused yeah, yeah, you to go down this direction yeah 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 again, again my apologies what convinced I, I you ramble of, on a lot. of of yeah I tend to, of your path yeah i tend to ramble on a lot so excuse me for that i tend to just go no, everywhere no. I, when, i'm, uh, I'm yeah. enjoying it thoroughly <laughs> good good okay um so this is a very big question what convinced me of my future goal this is a huge question okay where should I start? Should I start at, like, at the very beginning, halfway from the beginning? Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, yeah. L was there like a moment that you just woke up? You were in the middle of a <laughs> playground fight, and you're like, wait, there's this other way of doing things. I'm watching how people are behaving, and there's this other way that I can behave. Like, what <laughs> caused you to start to put your stock into your own rational uh, capabilities? Um. 
So I think it started with my study of philosophy. I, if I had to say anything, it's probably my study of philosophy. Because for me, philosophy is more than just an academic class, more than just an academic pursuit. Philosophy is a way that one can understand the very real stuff of life every single day. Every single day I philosophize. Philosoph philosophizing, excuse me, simply means to think about something in, in a multivaried way, in a way that is just a little bit more deeper than the surface. I philosophize every day. I was philosophizing before this call today about time and you know being a college student and finals and the stress it brings us and why is that why is that so uh you know it, it doesn't life it, well, shouldn't life be a little bit more broader than just a single or a few uh, tests that ultimately three years on the line won't really matter and I, I, like i, I philosophize all the damn time it's kind of a, once you once you get the bug it's kind of a kind of a <laughs> curse but i don't think i really started until i really began reading philosophy and really began considering philosophy i started considering philosophy at 16. I tried to read Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Um, oh, you just 16. dove into that part of the pool. Yeah, because I, I had no direction. Uh, if I could go back and slap my 16-year-old self, I would say, what the fuck? Excuse my language, but what the, f what the freak is wrong with you? Well, uh, why are you doing that? There are scholars who literally have been studying Kant for 30 years who don't understand what he's saying in that book. What's wrong with you? And I would shake him. But... I had no direction. There's kind of freedom in having no direction, but there's also chaos to having no direction. Because if you have no direction, you have – okay. What did George Harrison say? If you don't know where you're going, every road will take you there. George, the great George Harrison, still, one of the Beatles. Doing it yeah, in the Yeah, one of the Beatles. Is that how it works? Yes, yes. George okay. Harrison. George Harrison. The great George Harrison. One of my favorite singers. That's what he said. Um, and that's right. If you have no idea where you're going, it will just go everywhere. And you'll never really get to a place of satisfaction, I think. I think satisfaction is one of the biggest, one of the biggest things mm -hmm. in our lives. If we're a dissatisfied person, I, I think it's going to be very hard for us to, you know, uh, to, to be stable, I think. It's just my personal opinion. I think that satisfaction is pretty important. Now, satisfaction is not always, it's not always happiness. It's not always completeness. But it's like a bare minimum standard of being okay with what's going on. Um, so... I, I tried diving into Kant. Uh, I, I promise you, I only ever read, read four pages of that book before putting it down. Um, but I, everywhere I would go. So would you were kind of impressive. bookish to begin with, then? Oh, I, 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 I love books. I love yeah, books. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. What what but, led uh, you out you know, of like earlier books, like fiction? I would suppose to something harder. Like, could you describe that thirst? Was there a thirst? Was it an accident? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was, was a thirst. I I had a lot of so in my earlier earlier in my intellectual development when I was like sixteen. I am going. I am twenty right now. I'm going to be twenty one in May. Uh, when I was uh, oh, actually a few weeks actually uh, when I was uh, when I was sixteen. Uh, I, I really studied a lot of religion. I had an interest in mythology, interest in Eastern mythology, I had all that kind of stuff. And so that kind of led me away from reading the more fictional stuff, Dr. Seuss, A to Z Mysteries, The Giving Tree, you know, stuff like that, to reading more serious stuff like an Encyclopedia Britannica compilation of all of the Chinese mytholog mythological gods. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, that was the kind of bridge there. Reading about the Celts and the Druids and... Uh, in uh, Ireland, uh, and uh, I think uh, not not Gaul. Gaul was France, uh, and Britannica, Britannica, Britannica in the Roman era. You know, reading about the sacking of Anglesey, which was kind of like the Celtic seat of power hmm. uh, that the Rom Romans went to, and reading about how you know the Druids were casting incantations and curses towards the Roman um, soldiers as they came on their island and just butchered all of them. Just that fascinating stuff just kind of took me away from the mundane realm. Oh, and by the way, those courses obviously didn't do very much since they all died. But <laughs> the just, content, it, it just reminds me of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. But uh, it kind of took me away from the took me from the mundane realm to the more sophisticated, real life but still Tactical. interesting realm. Yeah, Tactical, yeah, okay. yeah, precisely, precisely. Um, you know, now my my interest in religion books was somewhat short lived I, I i need to get back into them because i think that you know it's very important to understand the different ideologies and paradigms of people in the world even those that are not philosophical some that may just be based in a sort of spiritual idea that has no sort of grander assumptions or uh, no sort of grander explanations excuse me um so that kind of led me out of it and I, this this is a story i tell all the time 2017 
This is a year after I really started getting into a lot of you know books about religion and everything. 2017, I was able to attend a seminar at the University of West Georgia in Carrollton, Georgia, that was hosted by the Foundation for Economic Education, which in my opinion is one of the best organizations out there on uh, talking about economics and a lot of social policies. Um, uh, I, they hosted an entrepreneurship um, seminar. Now, you might be wondering, why is someone who's interested in Eastern mythology going towards an entrepreneurship seminar? Well, I had always had an interest in politics. I, had, I was following the Obama years pretty closely. I was following, you know, that kind of stuff pretty closely. I had an interest in politics always. Why not? Um, and I think 2017, Trump was in office. I was following Trump pretty closely. Why not? Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life quite yet. Well, actually, I did. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. And we'll talk about that, but that didn't work out in a second. <laughs> but um, hmm. so I went to that seminar and everything just changed for me. I began, I was introduced to thinkers that I never thought I'd be introduced to. Um, Frederick Bastiat, Frederick Hayek, all these people I never had heard of previously. I'm like, who are these people? These are some awesome folks. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned, of course, I have intellectually matured since then. I've been able to actually read some of these people and see where I agree, where I disagree, where they're correct, where they're incorrect. But when you're in this sort of honeymoon phase of an intellectual journey, especially if it's an ideology that you like, it's like, oh my, oh my gosh, every single figure who purportedly represents my beliefs is correct 100%. No nuance. That's kind of what it was. And for a lot of people, that's still what it is. That's dangerous. <laughs> mm. That's dangerous. Even people mm. in the same intellectual tradition have fights. Even even postmodernists had debates with each other. Yeah. I mean, even postmodernists have debates. Even leftists have debates. Right? Chomsky is pretty leftist. And I think Foucault is pretty leftist, although they have different paradigms measuring the world. They had debates about justice. What does that mean? I mean, even those people have debates. Um, so you know, I just didn't know that there's a lot of more nuance and intellectual um, uh, complexity to and, yeah, tug of wars. Exactly. And really understanding those tug of wars really helped me to hone my own beliefs. Yeah. Because you go from general specific ideas of whatever intellectual tradition that you're in to more defined ideas that allow you to explain the more finer details of your ideology. I used to think that all libertarians thought the same. Then I realized, okay, no, there are natural rights libertarians. There are utilitarian libertarians that don't believe in natural rights, just believe in utilitarianism. There are anarchists who are libertarians, I guess, who really don't believe in the state at all. And who mm -hmm. could, who many anarchists believe in natural rights theory, by the way. Many of them do. Um, some mm -hmm. believe in utilitarianism. I mean, there are agorists. We're also anarchists, but believe in counter economies, and, and they're kind of like the intellectual precursors to Bitcoin. There are just all kind of mm. libertarians, mm -hmm. and there are all kind of mm -hmm. debates. I didn't know that. Similarly, there are all kind of conservatives. There are nationalists. There, there are more uh, patriotic, uh, uh, or less nationalist, and more about the ideas of the nation, the nation itself. Um, there are traditionalists. There are uh, there are moderates. There are Straussians. There are I mean, there are there are all kind of conservatives. There are Christian conservatives. There are secular conservatives. All manner libertarian conservatives like me. All manner of conservatives. Um, so I think that understanding the interplay between intellectual traditions has been very helpful for me personally. Um, mm -hmm. But so it, it went from that, just, just, just it went from the general ideas to understanding some of the interplay to actually studying some of these thinkers in depth, actually studying Bastiat, studying Ayn Rand, um, studying John Locke, um, you know, and then going into college and studying a lot of other thinkers that are not libertarian, studying Hannah Arendt, studying Globlin, studying um, who else? I've studied a lot of people over the past few years and i'll be honest with you i can barely recall some of the things some of them said because i've just it's been so long um, well it's studying, middle of finals apparently too so you're probably yeah. crammed to over four yeah yeah and studying thoughts and texts and where where are you yeah. headed with your degree are you gonna are you still aiming for yeah, civil I'll, rights I'll, I'll, I'll get to that no yeah. no absolutely not i'll get to yeah. that in a second oh absolutely not absolutely not yeah studying aristotle studying these very different traditions so i went from when i was 17 general ideas to when I got into college, became more specific ideas. To okay, I'm almost in the fucking earth because just how deep I've gone now. Uh, and so, and, and I actually like being inside the earth a little bit. I can still I still see some sunshine, <laughs> and that's all that matters. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's kind of how the intellectual tra trajectory happened. Now, this interest in natural law theory was actually prompted a few months ago. Um, I, I I was trying to I was searching for uh, critiques of Aristotle, 
because I found that Aristotle's idea of polis, this idea, this sort of structure that constrains the individual and forces virtue onto them through mandates, through legislation, I found that idea just to be incredibly um, tyrannical and, mm. and unjust. And I'm like, okay, is there any philosophers that critique Aristotle? Because I'm not really getting the sense that there are in my classes. Now, of course, I knew there were, but I didn't know who. So I, I, I looked around, and I saw a name called Hugo Grotius. And I thought, oh, who in the world is Hugo Grotius? And I find out, for Hugo Grotius, the idea of justice concerns individual rights, whereas for Aristotle, justice is about getting to the mean, the middle of the road. But for Grotius, there is no middle of the road. Justice either violates individual rights or it doesn't, hmm. and justice or justice. So I'm like, oh, hmm. this is kind of like my libertarianism a little bit. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me kind of look into this. And so I looked into it, and I just found a treasure trove of an individual who basically inspired every natural law theorist after him and, 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 and uh, until Locke. Locke was actually a student of Grotius, a distance student, never really stayed under him uh, intimately, but actually had a lot of his books in his library. Grotius also influenced Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the American founders. In fact, they, a lot, they wrote Grotius, actually. They read Grotius in their uh, libraries as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. they were, so I'm like, this guy is amazing, but he's not really talked about amongst philosophy people. So why don't I analyze him more? I figure out natural law theory is. I, I examine it. And now I'm in the process of writing a 25-page thesis on natural law theory and the, and, and the relationship to human freedom. So everything kind of has a snowball effect in my journey. It went from general ideas to specific ideas to more specific ideas to being in the earth, now working my way like a mole throughout the interior of the earth. <laughs> and, Sounds and like so an that's education. It's... <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's exactly what it is. Um, Career-wise. So I'm hoping to do political commentary as a career, actually. Um, the civil rights lawyer stuff, stuff I just, you know, I, uh, Thomas Paine and, and, uh, and Rights of Man is one of the most profound American thinkers, I think, even though I don't agree with Paine on everything. He has some ideas about obligations and welfare, and they're wrong. But Thomas Paine said that civil rights are a necessary consequence of, nat of natural rights. You cannot, he, this is explicit, you cannot have civil rights without natural rights. And this is basically an idea that natural law theorists believe. You cannot have any legitimate law if it does not affirm the individual's um, natural liberty and it does not affirm the individual's natural reason and volition. This is like the Lockean theory of natural rights as well. This is, Locke eventually yeah. developed this as well. I think that Ping was actually probably directly influenced by Locke. Uh, uh, no, yeah, Paine was probably influenced by Locke, I would say. Um, and I, I kind of agree with him, but my, civil rights in the United States these days is not at all about natural liberty or ensuring our ability to be self-autonomous and direct, you know, directing and directing self-directing individuals is uh, unmolested. I find that civil rights today is primarily about giving people things, giving people things, not making sure people can exercise their own thing. So, for example, a, a, a coherent understanding of rights will say rights are what you already possess, and we're going to make sure that these are not interfered with. Jim Crow laws interfered with the peaceful exercising of someone's individual rights. Therefore, we ship them back. But it goes further and says, okay, we've taken away the obstruction to your rights, which is all the government really has legitimate, legitimate authority to do under, under natural law theory. But we're going to go a step further. We're going to now impose our standards on how we think people should exercise their rights onto other people. We're going to make businesses do this particular thing. And that's, that's the inversion. That's the, the deviation from natural law theory that civil rights is typically uh, predicated upon. So when the civil rights movement began trying to force racist business owners to serve them, even if they didn't want to, trying to force tolerance and force virtue, that's when I say, you know what? That's just going too damn far. You should let someone wall in their ignorance if they'd like to. You should let someone do whatever they want with their property so long as they are not having an, a, a direct adverse effect on you. And I don't think someone, a, a lack of a positive is not necessarily a negative. Just because I don't give you something does not mean I'm taking something away from you. So by that by that theory alone, I don't think that a business owner should have to, you know, um, have anyone in their shop they don't want to have. 
whether it's a business owner who is a a, a, a nation of Islam supporter, who doesn't want to serve white people, that should be their right. And I have every right to abstain my dollars from them because under natural law theory, my property is integrally linked with my free essence as a human being. And all of that is under the umbrella of rational volition. So I, I think civil rights has kind of gone away from simply preserving rights to trying to impose certain ideas of what rights, actu- rights are onto other people through manners that actually violate rights. And many civil rights attorneys kind of partake, partake in that. Look at yeah, uh, I th- Ben Crump. Who is, I think you that, know, the sorry, go on. I, th- I think that there's a uh, strategic v- value in the protests uh, of the 1960s, uh, civil rights sure. protests, 1960, where, where the uh, 100%. You, you see those images of the black individuals going in, sitting at, at the counter in the restaurant and getting vilified, uh, and then I, I don't know to what extent the government themselves. Uh, Mandate it. They did eventually mandate that you can't segregate based on race. You can't right. if you're going to have a business. Right. You can't do that. That could have broken through something and done a lot to bring us a lot further, a lot faster. But it also set the precedent precedent that if you can claim that your cause is just. It can overrule what people say about you, what pronouns they use towards you, if they serve you or not, and then how do you exactly. get that back? Once, once you, once you break that, once you break, once you breach that wall, which could be good and probably was very good and very necessary at the time, just spiritually speaking sure. about America and breaking down those barriers and getting us to sure. really, really see each other as human beings. But now that the government and then the entire civil rights 2.0 or the legacy of the civil rights has adopted uh, certain ways of violating rights in order to impose values. Um, sure, and exactly. That's, kind exactly. Of, that's what you're saying. If, if I'm, yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I think that it was the protests, the sit-ins, the counter stuff, all of that was necessary, and I would have been okay. one of the people doing the sit-ins. I would have been doing them. But that was fine. My problem is in, in, in Title III of, of the Civil Rights Act where they say, okay, now you have to do this particular thing. When they prescribe a value onto you as opposed to saying, okay, you know, you, we're not going to take the values away. The government and Jim Crow was taking values away. They were inhibiting black folks from being able to do basic things that are integral to their natural rights, being able to even go to certain places without the government saying, you can't do this. That was wrong. I need to go. But I have a criticism of the government imposing certain values, egalitarian or otherwise, good or otherwise, upon people who don't want to hold those values. I have a problem with that, uh, especially if their values are passive values. I mean, a passive value, if there is a black person who does not want to serve a white person, that's kind of a passive value because they're not really taking anything from that white person. They're just not giving them something. <laughs> so now, whereas Jim Crow laws were kind of like a highway thief a, with, with a, a whole band of other thieves behind him, they were mm. actively taking away stuff from people, which is why they Do were you- wrong. Do you think that it's uh, proper then for a form of reparations to occur in order to right that no. theft? No, no, no. I if think, something um, was stolen, why shouldn't something be given back then? Well, so, okay, I, I probably use the wrong terminology there. I don't think your rights can be taken away because they are inherent to your being. I think rights are as inherent to who you are as a human being as breathing is. So your rights were not taken away. They were inhibited. Right. They were inhibited. It was a highway thief who was inhibiting your passage on the highway because okay. they because of this sort of arbitrary kind of criteria. Now, so even if, even if that in that inhibition has led to relative disparity in wealth aggregation between whites and blacks, you don't think that reparations to the government is proper? I, no, no, absolutely not. Right, I, think it's, right. I think it's 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 unjust. Now, look, I I I I, I, dis, I have serious doubts about how much racism has played a part in the disparity gap. I have, I have serious doubts. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll more than I can see that maybe it played some part, but I don't think it played or is still playing an insurmountable part. 
You can you can uh, say yeah, I, I, the the strongest argument that I've seen in Evanston, the city of Evanston, just north of Chicago, has made moves to work at this angle is that due to Black Americans not being able to own homes or own homes in certain areas, they <laughs> lost right. out on the accumulation of wealth that was very uh, very beneficial uh, in so far as the housing market up until uh, a certain period in our history was consistently a, a good investment so right. they lo- lost out on that right and i and i understand that argument but i think that it does again it does a few things that i think are, are not right if you want to understand mm-hmm. things it kind of conceptualizes wealth as something that i think is a little bit more sterile and static than it actually is i think that all of us have wealth right i think all, even in the economics is all of us have some kind of wealth even if it's very little wealth the clothes on your back are a kind of wealth i think that wealth is just such a dynamic quantity that you can't really say okay you can't really treat it as if it's like a, a, a cash pile. I think too many people, when they make these assertions, treat wealth as a cash pile. That's not right because yeah. there may be certain kinds of wealth that Black Americans did have that weren't really considered because they weren't considered to be significant enough. Or they weren't. They didn't fit into the, 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 the traditional um, statistical understanding of what wealth actually is. And that's just not. You have to have a more dynamic understanding of wealth. And when you do, I think that you see, especially today. I'm not sure about the 1960s. But especially today, if you if you under if you look at the average poor person in America, um, they have a lot of quote unquote wealth. I mean, they have TVs, health insurance, typically more room space than than poor people in Europe. I mean, the average poor person in America who uh, some would argue are recipients of institutional discrimination have a lot more wealth and more possibilities than the average poor person in almost anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. So you have to then ask yourself, okay. If wealth is this sort of cash pile, this sort of pile of all these quantities that have value in them in an economic way, and that cash pile has been restricted and limited from black people, um, you know, and, and particularly poor black people, then why is the average poor person in America doing very, very good? You have to ask yourself that question. Uh, you, have to, and you have to ask another question, too. You have to ask if maybe you can understand the condition of certain poor people through other measures than simply shooting wealth as a sort of cash pile, that wouldn't it make sense to also not treat um, wealth as if it can be hoarded or owned by a certain class of people? The same assumption that says black people have less wealth than white people is the same assumption that says that the 1% control 90% of the wealth. That's the same flawed assumption because both of those assumptions don't understand the dynamism of what wealth actually is. Mm-hmm. And they were and they rely on these sort of determined and fixed historical analysis. They don't really address, again, the fundamental nature of wealth. Yeah, like so, uh, saying yeah. Bezos has a trillion dollars. He doesn't actually what does that have mean? a trillion dollars. Yeah, no, what does that actually he doesn't. mean? What what does that mean? He has a lot of assets. I but he, he Bezos just can't go to the bank and get out and withdraw a one trillion dollar check. But in this cash pile understanding of wealth, he can. And that $1 trillion check. Yeah. And that $1 trillion check is this big cash pile. And compared to the average median American, like their cash pile is much smaller because we all give to Jeff Bezos and put more money in this cash pile. But guess what? Jeff Bezos every day, and he not anymore, he's not, he's, he's, he's retired now. But even every day, actually, when he buys something, when he goes out to a store and everything, that quote unquote cash pile gets pushed back towards people, gets pushed back towards business owners. Wealth is dynamic and it is ever flowing. It is not a fixed quantity. Hmm. So that's my biggest problem with hmm. how. And when I was debating someone about affirmative action and he mentioned the wealth thing, I'm like, you got you understand wealth in such a very emaciated way, dude. <laughs> now, this is not to say that, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna say that Jim Crow didn't have an, an economic impact on black folks. It did. But there were still, and, 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 and it was not okay, but there were still black owned businesses under Jim Crow that were able to provide an economic outlet for their communities to survive and exist independently of, you know, um, segregated businesses. That still existed. In Atlanta, particularly, um, there were plenty. There are plenty in Atlanta. There were, in Black Gainesville, which is actually about 30 minutes, um, an hour, to, 30 minutes to an hour north of Atlanta, which was. Yeah arguably more hurt by um, segregation than Atlanta was because Atlanta was, you know, always been a progressive city. I mean, even then there were black businesses. So, I mean, but again, they're look, they're evaluating the conditions of African-Americans 
through a collective um, metric that doesn't take into account the many different dynamic things that interplayed uh, throughout both during during Jim Crow and after Jim Crow. Hmm. So that's my, my that's my response to that. There's so much that we could talk about for hours, but we're at yes. We're all, wait. Did we start it? When did we start? We started it at was seven ten. I think. Okay, seven ten. Okay. So it's just been an hour and a half. Um, no, yeah. oh, there's so many things that going on in your mind that spark things in my mind and topics yeah, that we uh, haven't explored. Yeah, what? And, and, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry. What? What? Uh, uh, <laughs> you, did you, you have know, a sentence? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and look, you know, anytime you'd like me to come back, I would love to just come well, yeah. about anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you are obviously, you're bringing out a lot of, you're making you're making me really put form to these thoughts, right? Imagine my mind as a sort of maze, and there are all kind of <laughs> figures. No, really, really, really. Oh, it's I just like, I think, I think it's, your your uh, mind is like a dynamic conception of wealth. That's what it is. Okay, yeah, uh, so it's, it's, like, it's like... It's like <laughs> It's like, it's like this a maze. maze, and there are all <laughs> all kind of people in this maze, and they're just walking around, yeah. and they're hitting up against Bumping walls, each and other, they're screaming, yeah. and, and they're screaming, and they're fighting each other, and 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 then it was like, like so this maze is like a, an ending point, and the ending point is like the receptor in which I receive all the information, and like not all of them get to the ending point in time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> so it it can be very confusing sometimes, but you're you're helping me bring out those maze people. Give them a chance to, to fight and live. Well, <laughs> so let, let's say that we'll have another one of these. But before we end this one, you have to plug your work. Where is your work? What are you working on that people can consume? Not not just right. your professors. <laughs> so I, I have a YouTube channel. And that's actually my main thing. I have a YouTube channel called Christian Watson. Just type in Christian Watson. It's there. I do daily political commentary and I talk about philosophy as well. I have a Twitter at Official C. Watson. I have a Facebook, which is the same handle, at Official C. Watson. I have a podcast, which is more long form than my YouTube channel. It's, it's Pensive Politics. Please type that in. And I also have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Official C. Watson. So, Do you have a t-shirt? Uh, yes. Do you have any merch yet? I need to make merch. I need to make Do you have merch. a logo? I need, I need I have a logo, yeah. yeah. Oh, you got a logo. Okay. You're halfway there. <laughs> Just slap it, uh, on a, slap uh -huh. it on a mug or a stein. Yeah. I wonder yeah, if I can yeah, get I need a Stein on my channel. I also have a website, christianjwatson.com. Okay. You can go on that as well. And yeah. bare bones stuff, where I've been published, where I've, who I've appeared with, um, content information, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, enjoy your videos. They're, uh, you're going to have, if you keep that up, you'll have some pretty amazing content going on. Oh, you Just think keep so? On, yeah, keep on uh, accumulating, accumulating, accumulating that. Yeah, I mean, you're, uh, you definitely deserve more audience than you have now, and you will soon uh -huh. enough deserve plenty more. So hopefully uh -huh. people check you out and go over to your channel through, through me, and then uh, this gets you set up to the next notch on the YouTube circuit. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, look, look, I mean, you've talked to people like Lindsay, you know, Local Distance, Jonathan Church, some of the most erudite minds of our age talking about these very deep and human hu humanly deep issues mm. and the fact that you're willing to give me a me a platform little me is it's very <laughs> very very heartening so what's your when do you when do you graduate it seems a couple of years off if you're not you wait are you 21 yet i'm gonna be 21 in two weeks Okay, so we can have a beer uh, in June. <laughs> I don't drink. I don't drink, okay. Ben. Well, yeah, because we you're 20. Tea. No, I don't. I'm not into it. We, we, we can have tea. We can have okay. tea. Hot tea. tea. That's weird. I love hot okay. tea. Okay, well, we'll have a drink. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring some bourbon. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? It's weird. What do you mean? It's, 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 I like hot tea. Okay, you and Helen Pluckrow <laughs> should hang out. <laughs> oh, I love Helen. I love her work. Helen's awesome. I love, I love her work. She's awesome. I love her. I love her. What, what's uh, your degree going to be in then? Uh, poli sci? Philosophy. Of some sort? No, philosophy. Okay. Philosophy. Okay. philosophy. Yeah. So basically, I guess you could say my ambition is to be a political commentator. I'm using yeah. philosophy every day. Yeah. <laughs> philosophy every day. Every day philosopher. Um, and what year are you planning on graduating? So it's going to be my senior year, but I'm graduating a semester early. So I'm graduating a whole five months early. When? 
Like in December. tomorrow? Norm- oh, wow. No, okay. no, 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 in December. Okay. And normally I'd okay. be graduating in Excellent. 2022. But I'm going to be graduating this December instead. And so far, I've been able to do what I love, this YouTube thing. I've been able to, to do what I love for, you know, a small living. But, <laughs> my, <laughs> but, but a living nonetheless. <laughs> you know, I guess for a college student, what a living is is kind of insignificant mm. to what it means for a fully actualized adult. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I've, I, I, I've yet to meet one of those fully actualized adults. I mean, I guess I, oh, I see them ooh. being played on TV, but... Ooh, ooh, Ben's throwing shots at people. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm saying nobody's ever fully actualized until you're in the grave. Even then. Oh, no, that, 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 no that, that, that's right. That's right. I think Aristotle would agree with you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. That's right. That's right. No, I think that's right. Okay, now, not fully actualized, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm just, I'm yeah, not man. personally there yet. Well, uh, let's uh, <laughs> l- let's wrap up the podcast. We could chat a little bit afterwards. Thank you very yeah, so, much for joining me, Christian. No, I'm, I'm I'd love to. Thank you. I'm 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 happy. I'm here. There we go. I'm going to end the re- congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.